Check, check. And there it is. I'm actually going to stay down here on the floor instead of being up there because it's like, why am I so far away from you? Uh, we'll get this thing put up here. Very, that was a very kind introduction. I'm not sure it was a, a worthy introduction, but <clears throat> I am excited to be with you this, uh, here with you this morning talking about Bitcoin. How many of you possess Bitcoin of some kind? Okay, so then we really don't need to have this session. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, <clears throat> I'm actually not here to coach you or train you on Bitcoin or teach you. In fact, um, you can probably teach me a lot about Bitcoin. So I'd actually encourage you to do that. Um, I actually want to learn more about it. Uh, I'm fairly new to the Bitcoin game and, and my experience has been somewhat limited uh, in that space. <clears throat> Having said that, I think there are some important issues of how we talk about Bitcoin to people. Because one thing that I absolutely believe is that, you know, 12 months ago, how many of you saw a national news story about Does Bitcoin? Work with your setup? I think his mic's still on. Yep. Wherever he is. <laughs> Marco. Uh, <clears throat> right. So uh, let's see. Um, how many of you, yeah, how many of you have seen any kind of national news story on Bitcoin 12 months ago? 12 months ago. You did? Okay. So there was a few people talking about it. I, I had never even heard of it uh, through any kind of major outlet, through any kind of national news. And then recently, all of a sudden, now we're hearing about Bitcoin, right? Now, all of a sudden, there are, there are stories about it. There are reporters who are talking about it. Now, one thing you have to understand about um, <clears throat> those of us in media is that the first rule of media is that you are the expert on everything, right? You have to know everything. And so when you watch your local newscast or a national newscast, the reporter is never the person who knows very little and is seeking answers. They're the expert who's here to let you in on what they already know, right? That's the formula that's been set up. And so it's pretty funny when you watch reporters trying to explain Bitcoin or talk about Bitcoin. How many of you saw the guy who, who set up his Bitcoin wallet and showed it on TV and he got his money stolen out of it, right? I mean, that's, that's the reality of what these guys are doing. They have so little understanding of how it works that you get your money taken from you on TV. Um, and it's a pretty embarrassing thing to have happen, too. But I think that's, th that's the reality of where, where um, news media as a whole is. That's where journalism is, right? We have to be experts on everything. So one thing you're going to find is that very few reporters, when they do stories about Bitcoin, and as you're going to hear more and more about it, are going to talk about... They're not going to really talk about how to understand Bitcoin or where Bitcoin could go or what it could become... What I guarantee you, you're going to start to hear is how dangerous Bitcoin is, how risky it is, how we've got to get away from it, how it's dangerous to our economy and to our way of life and to our systems, right? And it needs to be, what's that ugly R word? Regulated, Regulated because that fixes everything, right? That's how we, that's how we bring sins to things that are senseless. It's how we bring order into chaos is to regulate and allow government to be involved in it. So what I want to talk to you about today is really about shaping how we talk about Bitcoin um, and how you share with people and, and discuss with them um, the ideas around it. And, and what I titled this today is, Is Bitcoin Real Capitalism? Now I'm going to see if this clicker works or if I can figure this out. I'm not an expert on clickers either. Um, I'll be honest with you about that as well. Yes, excellent. So, what is capitalism? Well, if we're going to talk about Bitcoin being capitalism, then we need to know what capitalism is, right? Capitalism is an economic and political system in which a country's trade and industry are controlled by private owners for profit rather than by the state. They're not controlled by the state. I think that's a pretty good description of Bitcoin. I think that's a pretty accurate description of Bitcoin. Um, it is about profit. It's about making money. It's about trading and, and deriving value from the Bitcoin, the currency that you hold, right? Nobody wants to hold Bitcoin if it's worthless, correct? Uh, if, if it's becoming worthless, then you try to get rid of it, and then bad things happen. <laughs> you find out that, oh my gosh, it's $1,000 now. What happened? Um, and so we have this process of, of, of talking about things, language. So one of the things that you have to understand is when we talk about capitalism, one of the ugly, dirty words in our culture right now is profit. 
right? Anytime you use the word prophet, it's considered like a bad thing. Even as we read that description, probably at least a few people in this room cringe just a little bit on the inside when we saw private owners for profit. There's a part of you that may, maybe was a little bit bothered by that idea because when you, especially when you speak that out to people, when you describe what you're doing as being about private and profit, it makes you sound like a robber baron, right? It makes you sound like a bad guy, like a villain of some kind. But that's part of the culture that we're in. It's, it's a media culture that's, that's created this. All right. So what is socialism? Well, socialism is a political and economic theory of social organization that advocates that the means of production, distribution, and exchange should be owned or regulated by the community as a whole. Now, we're much more comfortable with that description, I think, overall as a society. Why? Because we like the idea of community as a whole. We've been trained a lot over the last 100 years in our country to accept this idea of a greater good and community as a whole. And anything that you do, if you do it for private or selfish gain, it's not a good thing. So everything you do has to have some connection to the whole, the community, the, 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 the totality of us all, the greater good, right? That's the idea. And that if we're all involved in this together, then we either rise together or fall together, right? It's this very kind of Spartacus thing that we've created in our society over the last hundred years. And it's crept into all forms of media and conversation. So first, let's talk about this. Is the United States becoming a socialist nation? How many of you say yes? I would argue that, that we're not. I would argue that we already are a socialist nation. Okay? And, and for those of you, you know, listen, if you watch Fox, if you watch any of that stuff, right, all day long, if you listen to conservative talk radio all day long about how we're becoming socialists, we're not becoming socialists. If you haven't looked around, <laughs> then you would, you know, you should know that we already are a socialist country. We have a progressive income tax system. We have a redistribution of wealth. We have um, government that controls and regulates basically everything. I mean, we go back to this description. Production, distribution, exchange is owned and regulated as a community as a whole. Well, what we have in our society today is government that's involved in all of that and redistribution of all of that. Something called Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, all of that is a form of socialism. Now, when I use the term socialism, please understand this. Not all socialism is bad. So one of the, the mistakes that we make in language, I think, especially right now, is, is we have these, um, these certain words that we use to demean or attack people, right? It's a smear. And so when you use the S word, the socialist word, it's only used as a smear. Now, there are some forms of socialism that are not bad forms of, of either the, the way that people live or communities, so how many of you know that the very first Christian movement in the world was a socialist movement? The book of Acts says, right, the book of Acts says that when the first Christians came together, they all went, sold what they had, took the profit from that to the elders of the church, gave it to them and said, share it among us equally. That's a form of socialism. Is it evil? No. No, and the reason it's not evil is because it's an entirely voluntary system. So if people want to volunteer to live in community together where everybody shares and lives equally, there's nothing wrong with that. We don't need to, to besmirch that or mock that or attack it. Where socialism becomes problematic is when it becomes no longer voluntary and it's forced upon you. Right? It doesn't say the elders of the church went around into people's homes, dragging them out, taking their stuff, selling it and saying, we need to make life fair. Right? So... When we use certain terms, socialism, fascism, capitalism, we've got to be careful about what the meaning is. And I think one of the things we have to do is start, start using correct terminology for this. Okay, so is the United States becoming a fascist nation since we brought up that word? How many of you say yes? I think we're much closer on that one. I think, I think where we have, have been for the last hundred years is a, we've become a socialist nation. And now we're socialists who are becoming fascists. Let's talk about that very quickly. Um, the centralization of credit in the hands of the state by means of a national bank with a state capital and an exclusive monopoly. I can't read that very well. That was a terrible idea. I guess when it converted to PowerPoint, it didn't do it very well. Um, do you know who said this? The centralization of credit in the hands of the state? 
Karl Marx, that's right, Karl Marx said that. It was part of his Ten Planks of the Communist Manifesto. Now, when, when Benito Mussolini rose to power in Italy, he rejected a lot of the socialist ideas in Europe. You know that, right? That, that, so, that fascism was actually born out of, re, of a rejection of socialism. So what you got to watch out for is all the people, all the <clears throat> conservatives in America who hate socialism, who despise it to their very core, who want to push back against it because of its, its weakness, its inability to, to protect a nation, its inability to control useless and harmful freedom, that is, that is the birthplace of Mussolini's fascism. That's where it came from. His rejection of those ideas in Europe, he said, we're going to create a better system. And what they created was a fascist system. And, and at some point, I'd love to sit down with you and, and talk more about that. Um, President James Garfield, again, PowerPoint, thanks for your help. Uh, James Garfield said this once. He said, whoever controls the volume of money in any country is the absolute master of all industry and commerce. And so what we see is, as we've become a fascist nation, and we, well, there's so much more to say about this, we don't have time to get into all of it, but as we become a fascist nation, one of the things that happens <clears throat> is the belief that um, you have individual rights, okay? So how many of you know that fascism believes in individual rights? Okay, it's not a system where everybody forfeits those rights. The, the belief in, uh, fascism believes that you have the right to personal property, it believes that you have the right to have um, your own home, your own business, all those things, right? However, where fascism begins to really come off the rails is when it says, along with your rights, the state is a living entity that also has rights. And the state's rights always trump the individual's rights. Mussolini once said that we, what we had to do was create a system where the individual has rights, but has to be protected from all useless and harmful freedom. He says the individual, though, has no ability themselves to determine what is useless and what is harmful. And therefore, it is only the state that can decide that for the people. Does that sound familiar to you? That's, that is the society that we live in today. We live in one where ultimately the state says, we have to decide for you what is useless and what is harmful, and we've got to protect you from it. Because if we don't, your useless and harmful freedom could hurt me. It could cause problems for me. Thomas Jefferson, of course, once said this. He said, I believe that banking institutions are more dangerous to our liberties than standing armies. Already they have raised up a moneyed aristocracy that has set the government at defiance. The issuing of money should be taken away from the banks and restored to the people to whom it properly belongs. How does this all fit into Bitcoin? How do we talk about monetary policy and we're talking about Thomas Jefferson and we're talking about Karl Marx and Benito Mussolini and Bitcoin all at the same time. Well, let me tell you about, a little bit about how I discovered Bitcoin. Um, some guys that I work with who were involved in the Free State Project uh, early on when we launched the Truth and Media Project said, you really should start accepting Bitcoin. I didn't even know what it was. What is that? Well, it's like a virtual currency and, and they admit it. I, we don't know a whole lot about it, but a lot of people are really interested in it. Uh, and there's a guy named Roger Ver who can talk to you about it. Now, how many of you know who Roger Ver is? Okay, so he's called Bitcoin Jesus, and I guess he lives in Tokyo and t keeps very strange hours, right? <laughs> he's an interesting guy. So we get on a Skype call with Roger one night, and he just starts explaining, well, this is Bitcoin, this is how it works, and it's this decentralized currency, and it was created on the internet as an open source code, and there's a limited number of them, and they're hidden out there, and you have to, what are you talking about? This is insane. It was like talking to Willy Wonka right? It didn't make any sense at all. So, so who creates them? Well, no one creates them. They're already there. Well, well, who creates more of them? Well, they don't create more of them. There's only a limited supply. And he's starting to explain this, and like, my head is spinning. I can't even begin to understand what you're talking about. This makes no sense at all. So who controls Bitcoin? Well, no one controls Bitcoin. So we're starting to ex explain it. We actually had to have about three of these calls that lasted several hours for me to understand Bitcoin. I'm a slow learner, right? And so as, we're, as I'm starting to understand it, the more I hear about it, the better I like it. Why? Well, because as I'm, as I'm learning about it, I realize that Bitcoin, what sets it apart is one word. What sets it apart from Federal Reserve notes, one word, 
voluntary. What I love about this system is that it's an entirely voluntary system. So how do I use Bitcoin? Well, however I want to. Accept it, bring it in, keep it, use it if I want to. Don't use it if I want to. Have it in a blockchain wallet where government doesn't know how much I have. They're not regulating how much I have and when I use it and how I use it and where I use it and when it comes out and where it, it's, it's, a, it's a great system. It is a tricky system though because when we talk about this to people who are outside of a Bitcoin experience, who are new to this idea, when you tell someone for the very first time what Bitcoin is, their head will spin and it's hard to understand. How do you use it? Why would you have it? Why wouldn't you just have dollars? And so it becomes, uh, there's a lot of questions about it, right? Now, I was warned not to come here <clears throat> the other day. Uh, I was a guest on a radio show, and we were talking about Bitcoin, and then somebody calls in and says, I don't think you should go to that Bitcoin conference. And I said, why not? And they said, because of, did you hear about what happened with Mount Gox collapsing? I said, oh, yes, yes. And they, they said, um, I don't think you should go, because if you go, people are going to associate you with Bitcoin, and it's being proven now that Bitcoin's a scam. Oh, okay. Well, that, that makes sense, I guess, because Mount Gox collapsed, right? Well, I'm actually glad Mount Gox collapsed. We're going to talk more about that uh, in a few minutes. But here are the things that I think we need to do with people. Um, when, they when we talk about Bitcoin, when we, when we use the language, when we um, get into discussions with them about what Bitcoin is about, okay, there are certain questions that are going to come up, and especially questions that are going to be derived in the next few months because of how media talks about Bitcoin. So number one, is Bitcoin dangerous? That's the first question for you. How many of you say yes? How many of you say no? <laughs> to whom? That's a very good question. Good question. Well, Senator Joe Manchin certainly thinks that it's dangerous, okay? This guy does. Senator Joe Van Manchin has written to federal regulators urging them to totally ban Bitcoin, the cryptocurrency that has so excited the financial and tech world over the last year. Manchin calls Bitcoin dangerous, disruptive, and highly unstable. Addressed to Treasury Secretary Jack Lew and several other regulators, the letter paints Bitcoin as volatile and unregulated, a criminal currency already denounced by other major governments. So the reason I asked the question, is Bitcoin dangerous? And I love your answer, to whom? But he, this is what they're hearing. So people who know almost nothing about Bitcoin, the message that's now coming to them is Bitcoin is volatile. Bitcoin is dangerous. It is a, I, I love it when they use cryptocurrency too, right? Because it makes it sound like the devil's money, right? <laughs> it's cryptocurrency. It's dangerous, it's disruptive, it's highly unstable. What's funny about this quote, um, the one thing they left out is that he addressed a letter to Treasury Secretary Jack Lew and to several other regulators. Um, among them is the chairman of the Federal Reserve, Janet Yellen, was also told about the disruptive, dangerous cryptocurrency. So what he doesn't address, though, is when he uses terms like disruptive and dangerous and volatile, he doesn't address any of these issues. So, if somebody were to ask you, well, I've, I've heard about this, and, it, and it's dangerous, and it's volatile, and it goes up and down, and, and people can lose their money, and bad things can happen, and, and the government doesn't like it because it's dangerous, here are the questions you need to ask them. Well, is the stock market volatile? Absolutely it is. Yeah, no question about it. And if you don't believe that, then go back to 2008, because the stock market not only does it have these ups and downs, but now as taxpayers, we're having to shore it up to protect it from itself, right? Protecting it from itself. No one is asking taxpayers to protect themselves from Bitcoin, but we're having to protect ourselves from everything else. Is the dollar secure? Do you believe that your dollars are? And the fact is most Americans no longer believe their dollar is secure. So, you know, five, ten years ago, that's a much tougher question to ask people than it is today. But today, when you ask people, do you believe your dollar is secure, they're going to say no. Does Senator Manchin want to ban the auto industry? Because that's a highly volatile industry, is it not? It's one that taxpayers have had to shore up because it's collapsing. But remember what happens when President Obama and President Bush see that the auto industry is collapsing. What do they say? We have to step in and intervene because if we don't, 
those industries collapsing will drag down the entire nation's economy. That's, that's the reason that we're given of why we have to intervene. When you argue about, look, remember the, the, the Paul Ryan, um, I have to now suspend my principles in order to save my principles? You remember this statement that he made? He was talking about the housing crisis and the collapse and why we needed to bail out, bail out these massive banks and give them billions upon trillions of taxpayer dollars. Well, Paul Ryan said he was going to, Bush also said that, right? That he was going to, that he was going to uh, abandon the free market to save the free market. And then Paul Ryan said, he, to, in order to vote for it, he said, I will abandon my principles in order to save my principles, right? So when we talk about the auto industry and Wall Street and the banking industry, and we see the collapse of this stuff happening, it's important to understand that while those collapses are happening and while we're watching that take place, okay, the reason that we're given that we must intervene is because the entire economy could collapse. If these industries are so important to our economy, don't we need to just get rid of those industries? Now you would say, well, that's no. Okay, but that's exactly what this cat is saying about Bitcoin. It's too dangerous and so we need to ban it. Well, if you're going to be logical, then these industries, banking industries, auto industries need to be banned as well. Okay, question two, I don't know because my thing jumped around now. So <laughs> we'll skip ahead and see what that is. Oh, the answer is yes to it. <laughs> don't know what happened here. <laughs> is Bitcoin risky? That's the word, it's under there. And the answer is yes. <laughs> Man, this thing doesn't convert. Well, I, I make this thing on Keynote, and when we convert it over, I guess it didn't work. Uh, is it risky? Yes, it is risky. It absolutely is. However, unlike Federal Reserve notes, I can opt out of Bitcoin. I can't opt out of dollars. Again, when people ask you, isn't this risky? Well, yeah, it is. But I'm the one who gets to take the risk, and that's capitalism. Capitalism means that no one's forcing me into this system. No one's going to bail me out. If I have Bitcoin, I take that Bitcoin, and I lose that Bitcoin. And I've lost Bitcoin dealing with some unscrupulous folks. That's my issue. That's not your issue. It doesn't affect your life. It certainly affects mine, but it doesn't affect yours. All right, well, we'll hurry up here. And is Bitcoin capitalism is what that one says. And the answer is yes to that. Consider that every generation of American alive today has never lived outside of a central bank. There's not a single generation of Americans right now who have lived without a central bank. We, don't, we think that it's like always been there, and it hasn't been. It's only been here for 100 years, and yet we've all lived under it. They've never lived without central financial planning. They've never known a system where, a system where government does not regulate or control, and has never known a system where the risk taker can profit or fail without intervention. These are the ideas that Bitcoin brings back into the marketplace. And I, and I know we're, we're supposed to do like 20 minutes of questions, right? So we'll, we'll leave it there and let you guys do some questions. But to me, capitalism is scary. Listen, sometimes when those of us who believe in free markets and capitalism talk about it, I think we make a big mistake when we say things like, you know, capitalism is great and, and good things happen there and that's where everyone flourishes and we make it sound like it's all rainbows and lollipops, right? Only good stuff happens if we have capitalism. That's not true. There are crooked, unscrupulous people who do bad things, who will cheat you and take your money from you in a capitalist system. But guess what? Those people exist in a socialist system. And it's not just government either. If you're thinking, oh, yeah, the government, yeah, it's not just government. You're telling me fraud doesn't take place in our system right now? Of course it does. So capitalism is scary, and there are bad things that can happen there in free markets. But the good is the opportunity of what you can do outside of those controls. All right, we'll, we'll do some questions here. Yeah, let's get, let's get some questions in. So anybody have a question for Ben Swan? You got one here, one here. Where? Right here. Line up on me, if you would, sir. Uh, what do you think of the... Sorry. <laughs> what do you think of the altcoins and their competition to Bitcoin? So that's a good question. I don't know a whole lot about them. I won't pretend that I do. Um, I know that there are a, a, a 
kind of a host of new currencies that are coming along. Um, I've actually been approached by some people to get involved and help to lead the way on a brand new kind of currency, which I can't tell you too much about. Um, but I think it's exciting. I think the thing that, that will strengthen Bitcoin is when Bitcoin is not the only or the sole, which it's not, the only sole player in the virtual currency game. I think it's important to have competition because, again, that's a part of capitalism, right? Competition will weed out the ones that are good and keep, uh, or weed out the ones that are bad and keep the ones that are good. Yes. Uh, yeah. Who are the allies in this uh, public debate? I've seen Cato and Mercatus talking about it. I'm trying to think of some of the groups that would normally help you out on this debate that seem to be quiet. So who are, that, who are the allies, I guess, and why are they being quiet? Or who could the allies be that we're not Well, reaching? I guess that's, that's a tough question. That's a really tough question because um, Cato should be, I would think. It's hard to say, uh, I guess, who I believe should be involved in it, but, but certainly Cato should be. I believe that the folks um, who, like, you know, guys like Neil Cavuto should be um, a supporter of it. Um, you would think that a lot of the, 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 the big money guys, the problem is that so many of them are tied into the banking system and tied into um, systems of, of uh, Federal Reserve note systems, I guess for lack of a better term, um, that Bitcoin becomes competition to that so they wouldn't necessarily like it. The other thing I think you have to keep an eye on though is some of the big money guys are quietly getting into Bitcoin. So they're not going to promote it until they control a, a sizable portion of Bitcoin. And then when they do, then they would promote it and talk about it. But promoting it before they have their stake in it would just send the price up. And so they're not going to do that. So I, I think you might see um, where some of the big funding, because Cato is going to reflect whatever the funders you know, tell them to say. Um, I think when the, the money moves to Bitcoin, then you'll hear kind of the, the echo chamber start to make noise about it. So we were supposed to uh, stop at uh, 20 minutes till, but I just want to make sure that uh, you get plenty of time. Sure. We had 10 minutes um, before, so I'm going to do 10 minutes more questions. 10 minutes, okay. All right, I'll make this quick, and it's more particular to my, uh, my situation. Okay. You know, you know, I follow you, and I wish I was a journalist like yourself, but in the near-term future, what is your perspective? Will Bitcoin actually monetize freedom domain co content? Will it be possible? Uh, that's, that's a very good question. I think so. I think it absolutely could. We accept Bitcoin. We do. So I want to encourage all of you. We're, <laughs> by the way, here's my commercial. We're raising money right now for our second season of the Truth and Media Project, and we accept Bitcoin. So I even brought some little things with our, our uh, QR code on them. I'll give them to you before you leave. But if you want to make a contribution through Bitcoin, I think Bitcoin's a great way of doing that uh, because, again, it, it gives you that control and it gives you flexibility and it allows people to be involved in it. I think that part of what works also is that because Bitcoin's anonymous and can be anonymous, um, it's helpful because the the more that liberty gets pushed back on, especially in media, uh, the more people may want to contribute to that anonymously. Uh, before we go on, I want to mention, um, I'm, my name is Mark Edge. I host a nationally syndicated radio program in 140 stations. I think that Ben Swan's Truth and Media Project is the most important thing that's happening in the liberty movement right now. If I could encourage you to donate to get the second season going, I certainly would. Thank you, Mark. Uh, my name is Tim Rapp. Actually, I live up near Washington, D.C. So I uh, attended Senate hearings last year on Silk Road and all that. Anyway, I think your talk's very good and prescient. Thank you. I think a big thing is that mainly we do have the uh, debt-based uh, fiat currencies, mm -hmm. and they're able to run deficits and all this, and they don't probably like a stable type thing that Bitcoin would represent. So I think that's where they're trying to figure that one out. Um, so anyway, good stuff. and. Uh, Thank you very much. Thanks. You know, I just want to say, too, on Silk Road, I think Silk Road itself, the collapse of Silk Road, was a good thing for Bitcoin. I think it was a positive in that um, it, it shook, I believe, the image that Bitcoin is only used to purchase drugs anonymously, right? Which is, was a reputation that it was starting to be given because, again, this is the game that media and politicians play together. So it's getting this reputation that it's really only used for illicit activity, the collapse of Silk Road, and yet immediately afterwards the rise of Bitcoin was a positive thing. Just like Mt. Gox collapsing, I think, was a positive thing. Yeah. Yeah, actually, I was going to ask, uh, you just mentioned it. Why do you think it was a good thing that Mt. Gox collapsed? Well, because Mt. Gox was a bad player in my opinion, okay? So any, anyone who had money in there, and I did, and, and uh, I actually wrote a piece three months ago. I, I seemed almost a little bit prophetic. Uh, three months ago, I wrote a piece called Bitcoin is Soaring, but Beware Mount Gox. And I told people, look, this is the experience I had with them, and these guys are not good players. So if you have, if you have Bitcoin in their exchange, get it out of their exchange. And, and 
you know, then of course last week it collapses. And I actually reposted that piece recently and said to people, you know, I hope that you, some people heeded that advice. I had about a dozen people who emailed me or messaged me on Facebook saying, I did heed your advice and I pulled my money out and it saved me thousands of dollars. I think that's part of when people talk about the market being regulated or unregulated, it is regulated. Okay, it's regulated by people who say, this is my experience, this guy's a bad player, and that's how it regulates itself. Yeah. I wish I'd seen that three months ago. <laughs> See, you should, um, have been, you should have been on the website, man. <laughs> um, how do you, uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, Bitcoin, like you said, is a very technical field right now. Yeah. Um, I, I find myself explaining it to people on a regular basis, and, you know, you get kind of the head spinning thing going on, it's hard to mitigate that. Uh, what I usually tell them, I was like, look, if I was trying to tell you uh, how American monetary policy works, you'd be spinning even further. Yeah. But how are you going to, how are you going to present it? Uh, you know, what, what words are you going to use to like not scare people? And, and, and how, how, not to say dumb it down, but to make it palatable and, and easily I think, I think words like freedom, words like opportunity, um, which are typical, you know, kind of buzzwords. I think those are the words you need to use. I think you need to use words like capitalism. I think you need to say that it's scary. I think you need to say that it's risky to people. I, I think you have to be honest with them, right? So when you talk to people about your Mt. Gox experience, I wouldn't hide that from people. I can't tell them about that because then they'll think Bitcoin's not good. No, I think you have to tell them the good and the bad of it because the reality of what's happening with the dollar is good and bad, right? So you can hold all your money there and the good part of it is you feel secure about it. You don't, you don't fret about your money when it's sitting in a bank, but the bad side of it is you probably should. Right? Because see, tomorrow it could be absolutely worthless because today it's just fiat money. Right? So, and I think when people start to understand that, and by the way, because of the internet, people have a much better understanding of even the term fiat currency. I mean, who even knew what that was 10 years ago? And, and I think thanks to a guy named Ron Paul, people actually know that term now and, and fiat currency actually means something to them. Yeah. Thanks. Um, as far as selling Bitcoin, like you're talking about, yeah. it brings a lot of innovation to the table. You know, a lot of people are really, it could create a ton of jobs. Um, you know, there's that aspect of it. So if, if regulators come in and try to squash that, it's kind of a good selling point that, hey, you're squashing innovation and jobs. Also, since it's a global phenomenon, if the U.S., for example, regulates it too much, right. people will bring that business to other countries, right? Yes. So maybe that's another selling point. I just want to get your take. No, on I, think that's, I think that's true. And I think, uh, again, look, the, the selling point among millennials, especially among a generation that believes in, for instance, um, uh, the freedom to smoke marijuana, right? And they, they want marijuana to be decriminalized or even legalized, right? They understand this concept of freedom and having freedom of choice in the things that you do. And I think that's the selling point of Bitcoin is when I talk about Bitcoin, it's never about trying to sell you on joining me right? It's just telling you, this is my experience, this is what I'm doing, and I think it's a great thing. If you want to get in on it, the beauty of, of a voluntary system and a free system is you can. You're not locked out of doing it, but no one's forcing you into it. And I think that's, the, the, for me anyways, the major selling point is it's a voluntary transaction that can either reap great rewards or Nothing could happen. You could end up like getting into it and, and you don't like it and you get back out of it again. I mean, it's not like you're, you're putting your whole life into it and you can't escape it. And I think most people understand that concept when it comes to a number of different things, not just Bitcoin. Yeah. I think there's a real danger that Bitcoin can be seen as kind of a scary libertarian thing. Yeah. I mean, how many of you have read an opinion piece that's bashing Bitcoin and there's the gratuitous mention of Ayn Rand in the, in the column? That's, that's, a, that's a tell that it's a poorly thought out piece, I would say. Yeah. But I think the way to promote Bitcoin, I live in a, in a really liberal, progressive town in California, and there's a lot of people that are in kind of the maker movement and are do-it-yourselfers and, are, and you know, they love 3D printing and the internet and all that kind of tech. And I think there's a way to promote this is, hey, this is something you can do. You can, you know, you can use it to, to help people and, and you know, focus on just taking control and doing things yourself. And that, that's, that's pretty universal. I agree, totally. And, and, and I think even ter terms like organic, that it's organic money, right? It's being derived not from uh, a central system. It's not being printed by the Federal Reserve. Global community. Global community, yeah. And community is a good word, too, because people, people are, are in favor of that, yeah. One of the things that I use when I'm speaking to people about it is um, I help them understand that 
it's kind of like a small business that's just starting up and just, you know, the, we're at a time right now where the venture capitalists are putting their money in. Now, the normal public is not allowed to come in until after the IPO. And so this is why they don't really understand the volatility, right? Because they're not experienced with that. Yep. And so I help them understand a normal IPO. Normally, they're not allowed in until they reach a stability point. So they're not even allowed to be at the exciting time, right? But th that's also why they don't understand the dynamics of the volatility at this point, because but the VCs do, right? And so I just say, you watch, watch what the VCs are doing, because they're smart, they're intelligent, and they can track the market better than we can. Mm -hmm. If they're going in, then we can go in, right? Because they're accredited investors, and they know what they're talking about. Yeah. And, and, and so that's how I try to help explain it to people, to help them understand it, it's, they're doing something that they just haven't done before, and getting in early. Right. Yeah, no, listen, I think that's a, that's a fantastic point. Um, to help people understand the idea that when you get in early, because you can't do that, <clears throat> the other thing is you are held out of that system so that the guys who really want to make a lot of money are able to get their share first, right? And then you get the crumbs, you get the leftovers. And the difference here is that you get to get in on the ground floor, you have the opportunity. That is, again, it's a great selling point. The point is, guys, I, I know we're out of time here. The point is, as we talk about it, <clears throat> Remember this, that every statistic, when it comes to liberty, when it comes to freedom, when it comes to libertarians, when it comes to um, the independent movement in this country, that is where all the growth is. 40% of the, no, excuse me, not 40, 48% uh, of the country right now are unaffiliated with the Republican and Democratic parties as registered voters. It's nearly half of the country, which means that all of the trends in, in the TV world, it's all about trends, year to year, where are things going? All of the trends are, are in our favor, and I think this is a great opportunity to really push that forward just by having good, solid conversations with people. Guys, thank you so much for your time. We're gonna actually going to, if you don't mind, grabbing some of these and just handing them back. Just, so grab some and just pass it back if you would, please. Again, you can contribute to our project with Bitcoin and, and we appreciate it. And if you do that and you're done with it for the day, don't throw it away. Go hand it off to somebody in another session, okay? <laughs> Thanks so much.